Welcome to Strength in the Numbers. My name is Andrew Codd, accountant, author, and commercial finance entrepreneur. And it's my job each week to bring you leaders in finance and business and deconstruct with them their real stories, insights, and hard-won lessons into practical advice on the key strengths and qualities you need to remain relevant in accounting and finance today, as well as the steps you can begin to take to elevate the impact you make to have a fun, successful, and rewarding career in accounting and finance. Now let's go over to the show. Hi everyone. On today's show, we've Anders Leo Limburg, Head of Global Finance PMO at Maersk Transport and Logistics, based out of Copenhagen, Denmark. In his role, he's responsible for global finance strategy, capability building, transformation, and driving finance efficiencies. Essentially, you know, all those ingredients that you'd require to create a world-class finance function. So on today's show, Anders shares the four skills areas you should be looking to develop to have a successful and rewarding career in finance and accounting the key things business partners want from finance and the four ways to provide them with great insights. He also touches on how he's managed to publish 180 articles and rising on LinkedIn and why he's then gone on to develop his finance master series. Also, particularly because of this age of digital disruption with artificial intelligence, blockchain, robotic process automation and the implications there for accounting and finance. But rather than leave it there, he views the future as half full and then explores the potential opportunities we have by going down two roads that accountants and finance professionals can take in order to benefit most from these changes. I actually really enjoyed recording this interview because Anders' advice is very much to the point. He was quite frank about the future, the impacts, but also his advice was very practical. And none of the skills he was suggesting require natural talents or capabilities. They all have the potential to be learned. So that means all of us can follow the advice if we choose to. Um, One of the main skills he talks about is technical skills. So we have those in spades. That's where our strengths and the numbers generally come from. It's building those other skills he goes on to mention around that. So we can offer our business partners more value in the complete package of a a trusted advisor with really good sense of uh, what's going on in the business and so on. So they become successful. Our businesses become successful. And we can go on to have a rewarding, fun, fulfilling and successful career in finance and accounting. I go into more detail in Anders' bio on the show notes. You can find those at sitnshow.com slash podcast slash 002. Some of Anders' achievements. He's a prolific writer on all things accounting and finance. He's the leader of the number one finance business partnering group on LinkedIn. And he's also co-authored a book on finance business partnering. That's currently being translated into English from Danish. So without any further ado, let's go over to Anders and the show. So welcome to the show today, Anders. Before we get into it, I'm just really curious to know, given how much you're contributing for our community on LinkedIn, how much you're engaging with people, the questions you're answering, the questions you're putting up, given the fact you have a young family also, and you've got this massive responsibility at Maersk, leading their finance transformation. Where do you get the time to do it all? Well, I guess uh, you only have 24 hours a day, and uh, we just have to, to make do with that. So I don't get any more time than anyone else. But uh, it's about prioritizing and, uh, yeah, you know, doing uh, do, doing what you do, if you're passionate about it, you're typically also more efficient so you can get more things done. And that, uh, that, that that's what keeps me going. Some very good sort of thoughts in there, and I'd love to come back to particularly around passion and and how prioritization and efficiency, particularly uh, as things are going very digital at the moment. But I suppose uh, throughout your career, um, I'm just looking to understand a bit more about your the story for our audience. So, um, how did you end up in your current role, and and maybe give us some of the highs and lows of getting there? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so, so I've been uh, ten years with the Merck, which I guess is quite unusual these days for a still uh, still fairly young guy that you stay this long within one company because people tend to to move around all the time. But uh, I'm enjoying my time at uh, at Merck, uh, and as long as you know opportunities keep coming my way, then I don't see any reason for leaving. But I guess it it of course it's a long road uh, when when you've been ten years in a company to to land where where you're at, and there's a lot of things that have gone on to. To, to land there, but I'd say uh, the the main thing is really that I'm in trying to be an active voice in the uh, in in the debate about where how is finance changing, and that has sort of been a, a main theme for, throughout my career. Of course, it's been been stronger and stronger as I've moved along, 
but but uh, what I do in my job outside of my job is all related to how how finance is changing. And you know, telling an anecdote about that, why is that important to me? Uh, it actually takes me back to uh, to the time I was studying and I was doing some some uh, some study jobs uh, for various companies and I actually spent some uh, 14 months in HR where I saw how uh, business people were not really valuing the, the services in HR. They thought, they, you know, why why should they meddle in their affairs? Why can't we just do our business without them? And it was a bit of a I opened up for me and I said, okay, I don't want to spend my, my first 10 years of my career trying to change people's perception that HR can actually do a lot of uh, do a lot of good things for for the business, which I still uh, today also believe that they can do. So I, I went back to, to finance where I've also had a few few study jobs and uh, and said, okay, I'm gonna make my ground here and then see uh, see see what I can make of it. And then of course quickly I find out that you know people look at finance people the same way they look at HR people. Uh, and, and, you know, I couldn't keep, uh, keep running from this same scenario. So as I said, I, I stood my ground here and said, okay, let me, uh, let me change things for, for the better. Uh, and that's, uh, that's what I've been keeping to keep doing for the past uh, 10 years and then still will continue to do for, for the next many years, I'm sure. Uh, while of course, uh, trying to add value to the rules on it. And and um, I suppose is that one of the the main reasons why you sort of found your way into sort of a, a sort of a global finance PMO where where you've got responsibility I, I believe for things like strategy, finance benchmarking, capability building, uh, and transformation. Is it more oriented at the people, or processes, or technology? I'd say that there's a a, a room to to improve everything, but. But my main uh, focus is definitely on the people, um, getting the right people into these roles uh, that, uh, that that we have, especially on finance business partnering. But in general, I mean, getting the right talent to fill out our our BI teams, as well as uh, uh, you know, also getting the right people into our service centers who runs a lot of our transactions. I mean, that that is of course critical to to succeeding with the transformation efforts that that we have ongoing. So it's it's developing. The people that we have, and is getting the right people in uh, to uh, to fill our, our finance talent pipeline. And of course, I'm not the only one uh, working on this, and of course, it's also a, a role for HR to play. So I work uh, fairly close with my uh, HR counterparts, but also, of course, everyone in the in, in the finance team uh, who works more with the, the day-to-day business, where I really work almost 100% with the changing the role of finance and the people that will succeed in, in the present day and also into the future. What sort of qualities should should uh, current finance professionals or, or people hoping to have a career in finance and accounting be looking to acquire in the next couple of years? Yeah, so we've, we've developed a competency model which looks at 12 uh, different competencies but four specific areas, uh, which is technical skills, partnering skills, um, analysis skills, and leadership skills. And when we hire people for our finance roles, we say that they need to have the technical skills already. We do not spend a lot of time developing technical competencies. Yes, of course, it could be if you're a specialized function like a tax or treasury that you might need to go to some uh, some technical courses from time to time. But in general, no, that's not what we train for. We train for the pattern skills. And for the analysis skills, and when we say analysis, it's mostly around how to solve problems in a different way than uh, than people typically do. So, so those are our two core areas, which means that those are also the two core areas that are critical to finance professionals in the future. If you can partner with your stakeholders and create successful, lasting relationships, and in order to do that, you need to help solve their most critical problems. Uh, so, so those two go hand in hand together. You help them solve problems, whereby you build relationships and the other way around. And if you do that, you will always add value to your stakeholders, which means you will probably always have a job. It's fantastic. You sort of touched on adding value and relationships, you know, because I, I guess there's a lot out there being written and being said about the digitization of finance and accounting with the robotic process automation blockchain and the distributed ledgers there, as well as artificial intelligence, those skills strike me as quite human in nature. Would you agree? Absolutely. I mean, all the things you mentioned here, they are enablers of the 
future finance professional. I mean, today, a typical finance professional is stuck in doing data reports and analysis and spend way too little time on providing insights, influencing decisions, and actually creating an impact. And that's the exact change that we're trying to, to make here. So instead of spending two-thirds of the time on the first three parameters, we want to spend two-thirds of the time on the last three because that's where you really make an impact. But in order to do that, you need to have automated processes. You need to have BI and advanced analytics that works for you. Um, and, 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 and without, because without those, you will never be able to, to flip the switch on, uh, on actually sitting with your stakeholders, discussing options, coming up with ideas, and then implementing them for, 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 for more value for the company. Uh, so that is a critical shift that we need to make as a finance function and, and, and technology. Uh, and, and the things that are happening around us, they have to be enablers of that. So they, they go hand in hand. And and I guess the the hand in hand is very important because finance is only as successful as our business partners are successful. Uh, what what sort of things are our business partners looking for from finance? Is there any particular trends that people can sort of be more aware of? Or is there any sort of ways of figuring out how to best help their business partners? You know, our business partners, they want to make good decisions because that creates more value and that makes them successful. So that's what they're looking for us to provide insights that can help them make these better decisions. To get to the insight stage, we have to stop running tons of analysis, sending out reports on emails that never get read, and trying to figure out what's the right data and data source that we have to use. I mean, if we can't get outside our uh, office or away from our desk, sit down with our stakeholders, we will never get to this insight stage. So all they want is for us to help them make better decisions, but we only do that if we get out there, talk to them, understand what is the real problem, and help them solve that by finding insights in the, in all the information that's available to us. But we need to improve the speed to insight tremendously because right now it's either non-existent or it's way too slow. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and speed nowadays and agility in particular are, are key determinants of competitive success. And it's interesting that you know you say that because likewise, I don't think the finance and accounting teams are immune from that. And I, I guess maybe in the past we've been a bit guilty of not being as connected with, with stakeholders I'm going to probably look to shift gears a bit here, Anders, because there's also another world out there, you know, the cloud, the World Wide Web. I'm trying to think back to when we first connected, probably about a year or so ago. I sort of connected online. I think it was on LinkedIn. And and what's impressed me since then is you've got a, a real prolific presence on LinkedIn and you're constantly coming up with sort of new areas, new thought leadership areas where we should be perhaps considering to to do better or look at. How did you get into sharing your thoughts online? What was your motivation there? So, I mean, it, it goes back to the to the story I sort of told at the beginning that I want to help change finance for the better. Uh, I want to help create a positive, um, you can say, look at, at the profession of accounting and, and, and finance so we, we can get away from this uh, bean counter image which no one really likes to be, to be trapped in. So, uh, in, in, in my early days in, in the company, you know, I worked with a lot of uh, improvement processes, whether it was a faster close of the annual accounts or whether it was finding a different uh, budget model or whatever it might be. So I worked with these improvement projects and then, uh, once I landed in the States in, in 2012, I started to say, okay, let's, uh, can I find someone to discuss these things with? So, uh, you know, LinkedIn was obviously a good medium there with a lot of groups that, finance related and, and then I started to, to share some 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 articles of these things that the other people have had written and just uh, you know put my thoughts to it what uh, what should this be to so try to become an active voice in the, in all of that and at the same time you know of course I had I had my job over there uh, where I also tried to to really change the perception of finance so I did a, a specific project which had a, a label from the encounters to business partners uh, where we really changed the, uh, changed gears. I mean, the, the, the team I took over, I'll be the small team was running the really, really smooth efficiently and that the previous finance manager had done a great job in terms of the classic areas of finance. So there was really nothing for me to, to do there as such if I just looked at the surface. But once I did into it, you know, there was plenty of the room for, for optimizing. There's plenty of room for, for providing more 
the analysis and insights to the management, and definitely a whole wide uh, space for for starting to to partner with them and, and helping them create value. So that's that's what we did uh, in those two and a half years I was there. And then of course I was uh, interested in telling that as a, as a case story because no one was telling these case stories until today. Very few are telling these case stories about how do you become a great uh, finance business partner. And so I, I wrote a, a piece for the Exchange Magazine from the Association of Finance Professionals from IRAP. I wrote a piece for them about my, my, my case story there. And then shortly after, I started to, started blogging on LinkedIn because they opened up the, the platform for that. And again, you know, when I did that, I didn't have a big master plan of what should all this turn into. I didn't even know what to write about from, from week to week, but I just wrote about what, what popped into my head. And then it, then it started from there. And of course, in the beginning, you don't really get a lot of traction because, you know, who are, who are you anyway to publish these things? But every week I managed to, to turn out some, uh, some, some, some blog post. And, you know, over time, suddenly you, you, you get picked up on LinkedIn for what you do. And that helped create a lot of, uh, a lot of followers, uh, which uh, I greatly appreciate from LinkedIn. And then, you know, after that, once you start to have your, your portfolio, you can do shares and reshares and you can continue to publish something on a weekly basis. And, you know, then it's uh, 180 blog posts later on LinkedIn. But it's, it, it's not been a, a big master plan in the beginning. But obviously now that, that I've been doing it for so long, there's all these trends and topics that it, it's quite easy for me to either connect with people on what, what should, you know, where are we moving? Or writing my own thoughts in terms of well, what is it that I see. So, so right now, I mean, I have a lot of things uh, going, which is typically co-written with uh, with various people uh, that that know more about the topic than I do. But then I'm more a facilitator of this the knowledge, a facilitator of the discussion. And then, of course, I can bring it all together into one piece, like the finance master series I'm doing at the moment, of where I'm of course touching upon many different areas of finance where. I by no means am or can be an expert in. So I pull in experts from various uh, various places and then uh, write together with them. And then I uh, promote and publish the, the stories and bring it all together to say, okay, this is now how you should be a, a finance master, as an example. And, and look, that finance, I highly encourage our audience to check out this finance master series. It's it's actually quite diverse. And I think that's one of the, the nice qualities of it is that it, you are putting in experts and you are sort of saying look i know a lot about finance but i don't know everything and, and and leveraging those and facilitating those conversations and i guess that's what we're trying to do with this podcast and our audience here is just facilitating multiple conversations about what good looks like what great looks like and you know if we're helping a few people fantastic and it, i'm just curious anders with with the the social media platform you now have uh, and presence, what are you sort of ascertaining from the people out there? What are they feeding back to you? Well, I get a lot of the questions in terms of okay, so what should I do in my career to get to X Y Z? Absolutely, I get a lot of those. Sometimes, you know, of course, I also get input in terms of okay, what 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 should I be writing about? What are some of the trends that people would like to know more about? I mean, especially the the the, the blockchain part is taking off. Uh, like crazy uh, in these past couple of weeks. So I've gone from actually knowing nothing about it to, to being a facilitator of all this knowledge and, and creating groups of people of more than thousand people uh, that, that wants to know more about it. And then suddenly you get requests to speak at conferences, do webinars, uh, write all sorts of things. And, and, you know, you can do all this without being an expert if you can, you know, if you build the platform to facilitate things. So that's, that's really what I've, what I've done now. That means I get all sorts of impulses all the time from people that want everything to improving their careers to, to having me write about things and, and, and collaborate about a lot of different, uh, different projects. So I have to unfortunately say no to a lot of things these days because it's simply not, you know, again, you asked me about the 24 hours in the day. There's simply not enough time to do all these, uh, these projects, even though they could be very exciting. Uh, like that, that's so true. And I think it, it's very important for our listeners to appreciate prioritization is key. So, so I guess, how do you distinguish between something that's worthwhile following and uh, and not? I mean, it's quite a tough decision for a lot of people. How, how do you decide? I really think that you owe it to yourself to at least explore it a little bit. So I will explore a lot of things, and sometimes it's just a, it's a one conversation or a few emails, and then you can either say X, Y, Z, or yes or no. Uh, but if you don't explore it just a little bit, you never know what, what you're missing out on. 
So, you know, always take the first step, but then, uh, you, you gotta make up your mind and don't, don't take too many steps into it because then you're either gonna be disappointing people because you have to say no in the end, uh, or you're gonna do it half-heartedly, which uh, no one wants from you. Um, so, so, you know, be true to yourself, but always take the first step. Yeah, that, that, that's great advice, Anders. I, I know I, I, when I started my career, I, I was very guilty of trying to please everyone. And I, I know that was definitely impacting what I could do. And, and these days, it's much more different. Uh, and then that does allow me to do other things like the articles, like the book, like this podcast. So it, it's very good advice for our audience. You touched on blockchain there. And do you want to get into that? Because I've noticed a step up in your thoughts around blockchain. And it's a nice comparison because earlier in our conversation, we were talking about the human skills of finance business partnering and finance in general. Blockchain is more of a, I suppose, a technology that's becoming more and more prevalent. So probably less the human side of things. So, so where's the whole blockchain going? Well, as I said, you know, I've, I've really gone from, from, from knowing absolutely nothing about it, uh, to, 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 to where I'm now and, and I'm, they will never be an expert on this, uh, this topic either. Uh, but, but, you know, just taking you, taking us back to, to where it all started. So I'm doing this, this finance master series and a part of that, he's done from finance right to Europe, reaches out to me and says, you know, can you write something about blockchain and master data? I'm like, you know, I don't know anything about blockchain and master data. It's not really my thing either, but, uh, you know, let me look into it and, and, and see what it is. And then, uh, to get a bit of, uh, about, about blockchain. And there's a very nice webinar from How Business Review that I encourage everyone that wants to know more about the topic to check out called The Truth About Blockchain. And I, I, I look at that and I reach out to my, to my network on LinkedIn and say, you know, is anyone interested in, in talking to me about this? If you know more about it. And I get a name or two, right? And then I also reach out to the network and say, okay, if you come from a finance perspective, what would you like to know more about blockchain? And so then I have a few people on one hand and I'm sort of the interview guide on the other hand. And then I, I merge the two things and, and I suddenly I get some, some good insights from people that know something about blockchain, which I can then turn into two articles. And I think I've written three articles on, on this perspective right now, plus an, an intro post where I'm really talking about what is it I want to, to get out of this, which is really to say, okay, blockchain, it's a foundational technology that's going to have an impact on business. And if something has an impact on business, inadvertently it's going to have an impact on finance. So why, for once, doesn't finance get ahead of the curve and try to figure out how is this going to impact us and what changes do we need to make to get the most out of the potential in this technology? So that's really what I'm trying to explore now. And again, I'm simply exploring together with people who want to explore with me uh, and hopefully I can facilitate a lot of knowledge that will help finance professionals around the world take a more proactive approach on blockchain. Look, we really appreciate you doing that, Anders, and, and also that it's very very much in an exploratory stage at the moment. I suppose, should we be looking at this as a glass half full or a glass half empty from a finance and accounting perspective? I can imagine they'll be impacting some people's jobs in particular ways where there might be less required of them and other people, you know, it might open them up to other opportunities. As you said earlier, maybe speed up, you know, how quickly we can get to the insights as to where we are now. So I guess what are the sort of opportunities and perhaps risks associated with blockchain for finance and accounting teams out there? Look, I mean, writing about this in, in several articles as well, if you if you are an accountant, heavy on the transactional side, I mean, a, a billing clerk or AP supervisor, or whatever it might be, your job is likely not there in the future. So what is it that you can do instead to uh, to get ahead of the curve? And, you know, there, there are two roads to take in a, in a, in a very general, general speaking way. One is to, to specialize. So the accounting profession is itself is in growth because of specialization, because the environment is getting more and more complex. Countries are trading more and more with each other. The transfer pricing, what have you, all these complex issues need accountants, tax people and so forth to be in that space. So it's not going away. It's in growth. But if you look at trans- financial transactions, accounting, et cetera, as a, as a, as a ba- basic kind of profession, these jobs are likely not there in the future. The other, where the other route you can go is, of course, to, to, to go up in the value chain, you know, becoming more into, to analytics, coming more into, to business partnering, because there's not a danger right, right here, right now. Of course, no one knows what happens in, in 10 years and what have you. But, but those jobs will still be there in the future and those jobs are in growth as well. So you have to decide for yourself if you are a transactional, Financial or accounting professional, what is it you want to do with your career? And those choices 
are better made now rather than when you're forced to make them because uh, technology is coming to take your job away. So, I mean, so you, you ask if it's half full or half empty. It, it's for, for every individual to, to decide. Of course, I see it as, as half full, but that made my, my choice also a very long time ago. And I think that's the question a lot of our audience and listeners need to ask themselves, you know, is, is how can they be proactive about this and, you know, try and try and view this as half full? Because it, there's nothing worse than having change be impacted upon you because you're reacting to it. What I'd like to, to understand, Anders, perhaps is regards accounting finance at the moment, what's exciting you the most? Well, um, I just have to look at my own job, right? So I'm trying to create a, a world-class finance function at, at MERSC. And uh, that is that is truly exciting because it, it it allows me to to keep pushing limits of what we want to do in finance and uh, with with my purpose of, of of really trying to push the profession in the right way then then these things are all uh, all aligned so it's a really it's a really exciting times so, I mean uh, I get to do things like like talking to you on this podcast I get to talk to a lot of uh, consultants or accountancy bodies about what's what's happening in, in, in finance and accounting. I get to talk about the story that we have on finance business partners with Immerse, as well of of course keep developing on the inside with uh, with all my, my fantastic stakeholders around me that just want the finance function to do even more. So it's, it's a truly exciting journey all around. Oh, that this sounds sounds really awesome, Anders. And actually you you just reminded me with all that advice that you're you're being asked for and you're getting um on your journey. I was just curious to know you know, what advice would you give your younger self, say maybe when you were 20 or 25 years old or so, uh, when you were starting out? I think if you're just starting out, and I, I also wrote about this in a blog post some years, years ago, I think you need to focus on what you're doing right now. If you keep looking uh, ahead to what's going to happen in, in, in five years or even two years' time, you will not have the focus to be successful in what you're doing right now. And I think, you know, that's talking from personal experience. You know, I, I, I kept just looking, okay, so what's going to happen to me in two years? What's going to happen to me in five years? Am I more successful? Am I more up the career, to, the career ladder and so forth? And it just, it, it drains your, your, your mental energy for what you're doing right now. And it means you're not able to perform at your best. So if you are just starting out as a young professional today, then focus on what you're doing right now and do well. And then, you know, once a year, if you have a career talk with your manager, you can always talk about what you have in the next year or two, but focus on what you're doing right now and don't get yourself clouded up by what could happen in two or five years. Yeah, there's, there's nothing quite as distracting as getting getting all fogged up, getting all clouded up by concerning yourself with stuff that may or may not happen. So, again, very important to keep the focus there. And there's an, so I, I guess one of the most challenging experiences I had in my career to date, I guess, was writing a book. And, you know, you've co-authored a book and I've had the pleasure of looking at some early English translations of it and, and providing some feedback. Um, why, why did you decide to write a book? Well, you can say I, I'm the lucky guy in this book project because I was uh, invited on board when it already written uh, 275 pages. So to be fair, I'm not the main writer of this book. But uh, I'm, I've been fortunate enough to be invited onto this project because it is the second only uh, book globally around this topic, really counting counting your your own as uh, as maybe the first one. So that that is truly exciting to be part of such such a project, and it's a very uh, ambitious project with a very comprehensive book in terms of how to make a business partner a, a reality. Uh, and of course, you know when you when you write a book, you always have to make some choices and some 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 deselections, and, and that's of course also we, what 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 we've done. We're trying to give people a very practical approach for themselves and for finance functions in terms of how to be successful with this partnering. Because to be honest, uh, looking back at the past uh, 10 years or even longer back, finance as a profession has not been very successful with, uh, with business partnering. And that's why we're still stuck in this being kind of stereotype because we have not been able to convince our stakeholders that we actually can help them make better decisions. And, and, and we have to change that around. We have to do that now. Both, that's what we're trying to do at, uh, at Maersk, where we sort of launched a, a version 2.0 of business pattern, where we really have to be successful with this, but also as a profession, now is the time where we have to be, be successful. And I see a lot of excitement around the business partnering as a concept. You know, of course, it depends on where you are in the world, but uh, if you look at the FPNA function, they are also starting to adapt the concept. And certainly, of course, in the, in the UK and probably Ireland as well, they use some of the front runners in terms of having actual roles of business partnering, 
uh, but definitely the concept is, is broadened out and more globally now and we have to be successful. Again, I've only had um, the pleasure of seeing a few chapters so far on it and I have to say the words you use, comprehensive and practical, they're shining through already. So I can't wait to get towards the end of the book and give my, my full feedback on it, but absolute great job done on it and I, I can't wait till it's published in English so we can recommend it to our audience as probably the guide to go to if they're serious about being successful finance business partners. Yes, I'm definitely also just uh, sitting here waiting for the English version to to come out because obviously that's that's my main platform also on uh, on, on, on LinkedIn and other social media platforms and, and, and I have I'm sure a lot of people out there are also interested to, to get to know more about the book whether they'll buy it or not I'll of course leave it, leave it up to them but, but clearly it, it, from from my perspective it's a, it's a great resource in terms of uh, business partnering and uh, you know, again there can be many different perspectives on it this is one and I hope that the future readers will, uh, will find it uh, value added. Talking of resources Anders you mentioned we obviously mentioned the book now, would there be any sort of other resources, books, audio books that, that you'd recommend for our audience to go and follow up uh, after this podcast? Well, I think if there's one book you should read, uh, and it's not a finance book, it's a personal development book, I'd say, then I, I'd encourage you to look at the book called The Power of Full Engagement. Uh, and it's really about how to manage your energy better. So how to be able to perform when you need to perform and how to to relax and recharge energy when you need to do that. Because uh, if your energy level is not where it's supposed to be, you will not be performing the way you want. And uh, of course, that's not a nice situation for anyone to be in. If there's one thing colleagues in accounting finance could, you know, could do better and stay, stay relevant, what should we be looking to do over the next 12 months in your mind? To me, it's quite simple. Get up from your desk, go to a most important stakeholder, Ask him or her what is your most important challenge or problem that you're working on right now and how can I help you solve it. If you do that today, tomorrow, every day, the next year, you will find yourself in a much better place, of course, providing that you actually can help them solve that problem. Anders, th- thanks for telling us how it should be. <laughs> and I hope, I uh, hope, yeah, no, I, it, it sounds so simple, but it's amazing. That's, that's how finance business starts. You know, in my mind, it's a simple case of you ask people, what is it that they want? You ask them what they think they have. The gap is the problem we go solve. We solve those problems. We're, we're adding value. Then from there, we can add credibility, build trust, those relationships you were talking about earlier yeah. over time. It, it just builds momentum and more momentum. And imagine if you build on that every week. And you look back at the end of 12 months time, looking back on how you've done during the year, you would have come so far, finance would have come so far, and it just then builds a better platform to tackle the next 12 months and build from there. And if we do things like that, I guess that's the proactivity you're talking about earlier as well, that we can get ahead of some of these mega trends and these changes that we're seeing in finance and accounting at the moment. Yeah, and maybe just expanding a bit on it. I mean, Jim, you will often hear, the, the excuse that, yeah, I talked to my stakeholders and they're really happy with what they're getting, so I don't really know what should I be doing. And I think there are, there are two more things to consider here. Well, one is, if your stakeholder is, is not letting you know what their true problems are, well, then you've got to try and find out for yourself and surprise them in a positive way. You can continue to surprise them in a positive way. You will build the relationship. They will open up and suddenly it will be much easier to collaborate about things. And even if you can't figure it out for yourself, then every meeting you sit in with your stakeholders, they will be talking about issues that you can do something about. Even if they're not speaking directly to you, even if they're having a conversation with someone else, you can pick up on it. I mean, just to give you an example, I was uh, at a meeting uh, last week with some of our, uh, some of our CFOs in, 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 in one part of our business, and they had uh, a key business stakeholder come in every morning at the start of the that they're meeting day and then talk about whatever was on the agenda. And of course, they were speaking directly to these CFOs, but still, this particular stakeholder that had in that the day I was there, she was mentioning at least five to six things that these CFOs could go straight back to their teams and say, okay, this is the most important problem we have to work on right now because if we can solve this, we will be solving the problem of one of our most important stakeholders. But the stakeholder never really said to them, okay, I have, you have to fix this for me. But you can pick it up, do it anyway, try it in a positive way, and you build the relationship. And it's, it's really that simple. Whenever you have an interaction, there's something to pick up on, that you can turn into something that helps you build the relationship, help you add value. 
Yeah, I, actually, there's, there's a good saying you just reminded me of. That's why we've two ears to listen twice as much as we speak. <laughs> so, um, so, and again, it's a simple advice, but, but uh, he did it very well and that has helped me. So, Anders, thank you for sharing such a relevant example as well. We were talking a bit about the future there. You know, in your mind, what's the most important quality for an accounting finance professional to have today? The most important quality is the ability to develop relationships. If you can develop a relationship with your stakeholders, then uh, then you come out as a winner. Because, you know, being able to develop a relationship, it, it takes in all the things that a finance professional has to be able to do. Because if you, if you can't, you know, if you can't do analysis, if you can't solve problems, uh, if you can't, you know, if, if you can't do all sorts of things that are related to finance, you will not be able to develop that relationship. So that is really, that is really what's key. I mean, someone without any skills, any ability to do anything, to not be able to develop a uh, a good relationship with an important stakeholder, so so that that for me would be the the, the one thing that I have to choose. Uh, I suppose if I'm looking at the hiring profile, I know when I started in accounting, probably weren't we weren't the best relationship builders to help people start on that journey. Is there is there something they could perhaps start with? Maybe as, as you said earlier, that they just go out there and ask people, you know, how can they help? What's their main challenges? You know, I think then you can do a lot of homework before you just get up from the desk. And when I say homework, I don't mean, you know, refine your analysis a bit more. I look, you mean more mean look at what kind of tools can I use to partner with my stakeholders? Uh, so, so first of all, you know, what is your own personality profile? What preferences do you have for, for uh, interacting with people? And what is the profile of your stakeholders? Because typically, you know, they could be the same. They could be different. But you cannot always just do your own approach to towards the willing developing of relations towards taking talking to your stakeholders. So try to figure out what kind of profiles are you? Are you someone that likes to speak with the results? Are you someone that likes to explain the process? Or are you someone that likes to talk about, you know, what happened over the weekend or the last vacation? That's your preference. Your stakeholder has a preference as well. Could be the same, could be different. But if you don't consider those preferences, you will more often than not have a let's say a, a strange conversation and your, your relationship will not uh, really develop in, in the right direction so that's that's one thing the other thing is of course and i think you touched upon some of the elements but looking at the the trust equation because trust is key to any successful relationship so are you credible with what you do do they trust your your, your product are you reliable do you deliver when you say you want to you want to deliver um do you have intimacy? So can you actually have a good conversation with them around maybe things that are not just business related and uh, it doesn't have to be uh, something private. It could just be something, uh, some personal experience that you share together, uh, the latest team building or whatever it might be. So those three elements. And then I think you also touched upon it just in a different way. You know, are you oriented towards your stakeholder or yourself? So do you listen more than you speak? And if you listen more than you speak, then uh, it will also help you to build trust. So. Knowing the profile, looking at, at your, your trust equation with your stakeholder, then the only thing you need to do is really just to create uh, some, uh, some, some touch points with your stakeholders. It could be a formal meeting. It could be an elevator conversation. It could be at the coffee machine. Every time you have an interaction with the stakeholder, use it to advance the relationship. So listen to what they have to say. Make sure you've understood what they said and then offer suggestions in terms of how to advance the agenda. Those three things would help you build a successful relationship, and uh, that is the one key thing that finance professionals need to do to stay relevant and add value. Anders, ab- absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much for for going a bit deeper on that. Before we go, I was just just wanted to ask you, in case um, any of our audience are interested in finding out a bit more about you uh, or connecting some more with you, what's the best way they do that? Well, the best way to connect with me is definitely on LinkedIn. That's my most uh, active active platform and uh, if you connect with me you will definitely see that and just remember I'm there to to help finance professionals grow and I'm there to help companies develop their their finance function and and so you can always reach out to me I think uh, these days uh, unfortunately I'm, I'm running quite quite far behind on actually in interacting with all the people that reach out so uh, so it, it is becoming increasingly challenging but then hopefully all the, the, the resources I provide to people will uh, they will also find uh, find helpful. But I try to respond to all the, the engagement I get there. So that's definitely the best platform. Uh, Anders, thank you so much for being an absolute great guest and for just the amount of insights you had. I'm going to have a lot of fun writing up the show notes for this episode. 
and putting links to the various resources you mentioned. Thanks again for making the time. And thank you for having me, Andrew. So there you have it. Hope you enjoyed today's show. If you'd like to know more about our guests today, their bio, and follow up on the resources mentioned during the show, you can find all the relevant links and more at sitnshow.com. There you'll also be able to get access to earlier shows, read the latest blogs. There's also an opportunity to subscribe to our newsletter, which will give you heads up as to when the next show is coming out, latest events, news, and anything that's going to be relevant to help you have a fun, rewarding, and successful career in finance and accounting. And just before you go, we really appreciate your feedback. If there's something we can do better on the show, something that's not working, or something you'd like to see, even a guest you'd like for us to invite onto the show, someone who you think might be able to benefit you more and also the rest of our community, please let me know. You can email me. I'm at andrew at sitnshow.com or feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Just drop me a message so I know how you found me and we can connect. And really, it's our community that will make the show. If we keep engaging and driving each other on, we'll keep on building our strength in the numbers. When all is said and done, if we can do the numbers better and finance better, we'll create more opportunities for ourselves, our friends, our families, our communities and our businesses. So until next time, have a good rest of the week. Take care and let's keep building our strength in the numbers. (laughs) 